Happy Pride Month, everyone. I'm Tommy McFly. Welcome to NBC4's very first Pride Month special. We're here on Pennsylvania Avenue in the middle of the Capitol Pride Festival. Over the next half hour, we're going to take you on a journey looking at the history of Pride here in D.C. You're going to meet some incredible trailblazers, and we're going to learn what the future of Pride holds. It's been three years since we've been able to gather together on this scale on Pennsylvania Avenue and all around the D.C. region, thousands celebrating our diversity and our differences. It means so many people are behind us and with us. Yeah, you can feel it, you know, it's just like the build up to Everyone's to the day. smiling. We're having a great time in D.C. We are all different stripes in the rainbow. We always rise from the ashes. We feel more together right now. Never let someone take you for granted. Happy Pride, everyone! Pride is steeped in a deep history of protests, parties, and parades, starting with the Stonewall Riots in New York City that became the cradle of the modern gay rights movement. Here in D.C., we've got our own history that's storied and goes back nearly 50 years. a half a million people now gather in D.C. for Capital Pride events. But to understand how it all got started, we have to go back. Almost 50 years to a small block on 20th Street Northwest. The store is right here on the left side of this building on the first floor. Where Deacon McCubbin was living his life out loud. The owner of Lambda Rising, one of the few gay bookstores in D.C. We always every year went to New York for their Pride celebration. But why don't we ever hold something here in Washington? And I thought, wow, that's a wonderful idea. And there, the spark for a celebration that would forever change the gay community here. But first, Deacon had to get permission from everyone on the block to close the street. We only had one person on the block who refused to sign the petition, which was pretty wonderful back in 1975. Gay Pride Day was held on June 22nd, 1975. The first officially recognized Pride celebration in D.C. It was a smidgen of what we think of as Pride today, but a wonderful smidgen. <laughs> a few booths, some music, and food, but 2,000 people showed up. And we knew right then that it was going to be an annual event. I recall attending the very first one. Lou Chabarro, who reports for the Washington Blade, was there that day and says back then it was a risk for many who weren't out. Some, I, I remember them telling me that Gee, if uh, my boss were to see me, I could get fired. And many were not out to their families as well. And uh, they were worried about television coverage. But despite those fears, the crowd grew each year. When the Pride event outgrew the space on 20th Street where it started, uh, the decision was made to come here. Moving to bigger spots near P Street in the 80s, downtown to Freedom Plaza in the 90s, and eventually in front of the Capitol. We've been uh, here now um, well over 20 years. I think we, we recognize the sort of responsibility that we have as uh, the nation's capital. You know, sort of the eyes of the country, from some respects the eyes of the world. Are on us. The first Pride Parade didn't happen in D.C. until 1981, going from Meridian Hill Park toward DuPont Circle. We are a very large and diverse group, and we're very powerful, and we're ready to make a lot of changes in D.C. and the country. As the 90s came, some communities felt the need for more representation and started their own Pride events. They wanted more visibility and resources to help family and friends. So, Banneker Field is where the first official Black Pride started. The nation's very first Black Pride happened in 1991. It was a way to get community to come together to raise funds for, you know, the community that was suffering with HIV. Um, a lot of individuals have passed, they couldn't afford medication and so forth, but that's really what catapulted the Black Pride movement. Always held on Memorial Day weekend as a kickoff to Pride Month, now attracting more than 65,000 people to D.C. Because it has grown from just coming here in this field to now, you know, celebrities and major companies and everyone wants to be a part to have really pushed the message of what Black Pride is. <laughs> 
2007 saw our city's first Latino pride, founded by Jose Gutierrez. I said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it because it's like uh, having a uh, safe space to celebrate. That same year launched the first Capital Trans Pride. It was just more of like, I want to build this community or I don't see a community and there's a need for it. Originally held in the basement of a church, started by activist Savannah Wanzer. From that small group of, of friends who just want to be with each other to where it is now, where it becomes multi-day, conference style with networking and entertainment. Now more than half a dozen pride groups call DC home offering events and support throughout the year, including youth, silver, and AAPI pride. It sort of um, mirrors the, the, um, the, the growth and the acceptance of the community. A movement started 47 years ago on just one block that continues to grow. There's always a need for a community, for, for people to have a place they can go to be with their people. A big thanks to the Rainbow History Project for helping us out with that story. And if you want to learn more about any of the various pride groups, head on over to the NBC Washington app. When we come back, the state of the country, an unprecedented spike in legislation impacting the LGBTQ community and why advocates are concerned. Stay with us. Welcome back. Pride as we know it has its roots in protest. People fighting for equality and representation. Our Jumio Labanji spoke to some who are concerned with the recent spike in anti-LGBTQ legislation all across the country and what that message might be sending to young people in the queer community. 2022 is set to break a record, and it's not one that trans activist Colton Gibbons is proud of. America, we have so many problems. Like, why are we focusing on the trans community like this? He's shocked at the number of anti-LGBTQ bills introduced this year, many aimed at the trans community. He worries about those young people struggling to live their authentic lives. You literally have society scrutinizing you and pinning you up against a wall with all these bills that are just saying that you don't belong. News 4 analyzed data from the advocacy group Freedom for All Americans, which tracks legislation and found more than 260 bills already this year that would restrict LGBTQ rights. 140 of those focused on the trans community. This is very unusual. Unprecedented, I think, is the right word. NBC News Justice no Department correspondent Pete Williams says, to some extent, this is solution in search of a problem. For example, five states have passed laws banning transgender girls from playing on girls' sports teams in public schools. And yet, in some of those states, there aren't even any transgender athletes that would want to play on those teams. The, the legislators say, well, we know it's happening elsewhere. We don't want it to happen here. But it's such a tiny phenomenon, and yet the states are reacting as though it's some huge problem. What happens to communities when these sorts of laws um, are not just introduced, but passed. I, I think that just that just that adds a certain level and an extra level of fear. Dr. Stephen Forsell is the founding director of the LGBT Health Policy and Practice Program at George Washington University. He says these bills attack not only trans kids, but their parents and providers. What does that do to families? Sexual and gender minorities are already at risk for a, a lot of things that uh, you know, cisgendered and, and straight kids aren't. Um, they're at higher uh, risk for elevated levels of depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, suicidal attempts. According to the Trevor Project, LGBTQ youth are more than four times as likely to attempt suicide than their peers. With every month that there's more legislation built onto that, that their mental health is going to decrease and due to the societal impact of how this legislation is actually reaching children. At the same time, research shows increasing public support for rights of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender and queer people. According to the Public Religion Research Institute, nearly 8 in 10 Americans support laws that protect LGBTQ people from discrimination in jobs, housing and public accommodations. So what's leading to an increase in legislation? I think there are two forces at work here. One is uh, in Republican states where Republicans have dominated the legislature, they've made the decision, you can look at it 
one way or the other, they've either decided that this is of concern to their constituents or they've just decided that this is an animating principle to motivate their base. Advocates say they too are trying to motivate their communities, providing more education and visibility with the trans community. Legislators are going to be up for a fight, right? Because this younger generation is, is, is not backing down. You know, we just wanted to exist, um, live our everyday lives over here, and do the same exact thing that so many people um, in this country are doing. Colton hopes young people feeling overwhelmed by what's going on in this country can turn to support groups like his nonprofit that offers fitness and mental health assistance. We are creating safer and better circles, even though it feels like all this legislation and what people's unsolicited opinions are saying and all these keyboard warriors like to say online that there are safe spaces. People without the representation, without seeing somebody out there that looks like them, they're not going to think that their future is possible. There's more to this story on the NBC Washington app, including information about the legislation and resources for families. Ahead, calling for change. She's one of the most outspoken leaders in the LGBTQ community in D.C. We catch up with Washington Mystic star Natasha Cloud when our Pride special returns. Welcome back to our D.C. Pride is Universal Better Together special. I'm Tommy McFly along with the Peacock. Woo! We're having our very first Pride special for NBC4. She's gone from athlete to activist to superstar. Natasha Cloud of the Washington Mystics made a name for herself off the court fighting for social justice. And now we learn what Pride means to her. Together! Pride for me is such an exciting time, especially here in D.C. Um, the parades that happen, you have people from all over the world, different cultures, different backgrounds, uh, different colors, different shapes, sizes, all that uh, coming together for one common theme, and that's just love. Pride in yourself, pride in who you are, what you are, what you're made up out of, um, and, and being proud of the life that you live and being unapologetically you. So my first Pride event was here in D.C., and it was actually before I even came out. Um, I was trying to just kind of navigate, you know, when you're young, you're still trying to figure out who you are and grow into your adult self. And, um, you know, being able to go to Pride, I've always been supportive of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, but that experience in itself, I was like, this is such a beautiful and powerful thing. Ever since then, uh, whenever they say, does anyone want to do the Pride event, I'm always down. Um, and making sure that the mystics are represented as well, um, because I feel like our team, our league is so inclusive and regardless of who you are, what you are, what you're made out of, uh, your religion, your background, you have a space here with us. God has blessed me in an abundance of ways and uh, the biggest one is, is this game and the platform that it allows me to have and being able to be a voice for the voiceless. Obviously everything that I'm made up of, everything that I identify as, as Natasha Cloud, uh, that's what I fight for. And so I'm gonna fight for the LGBTQ plus community. I'm gonna fight for women and their rights to their body and their choices. I'm gonna fight for the black community. That's really important to me. Obviously the ball stops at some point, right? And I really do think that I wanna take a dive into politics, um, especially I'm from Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia has now surpassed and is one of the most violent cities in America. And uh, so whether that's being the mayor of Philadelphia or the governor of Pennsylvania, I think that there should always be a pride to be able to come together to celebrate one another um, and to show that genuine love. It really does make a difference in people's lives to know that um, you may feel alone, at, at points, but there is a community out here that loves you, that will support you, that will hear you, that will be there for you. When we come back, what does the future hold? Will we always need pride? Plus, a special performance by young people who are writing their own story. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to our DC Pride is Universal special, Better Together. Many have asked, will Pride always be necessary? Here on Pennsylvania Avenue, the answer is yes, especially in the years to come. While Pride has been around for decades, you know, we need this. You know, this is everything for us. We're having the best time ever, aren't we? What do you think? It continues to draw huge crowds. The fact that we are here is not about a party alone. It's about a celebration of victories. It's good to get, you know, get our child to be able to see more families like ours. And for someone out there, pride is always new. It's always fulfilling to see people who have never been before and the joy that they get. Uh, from being here. Most we asked said there will always be a need to come together as a community. I don't think it's ever going to be a time where we could say we don't need to celebrate that history anymore. Do you think that pride will still be necessary in the future? Uh, I think so. You still do need to confirm and reaffirm pride in uh, who you are as well as the younger generations. And there's already big plans for Capital Pride's 50th celebration in 2025. The 50th is going to be crazy. A citywide celebration well beyond pride as we know it. We're reaching out to museums, um, we're reaching out to um, folks who you normally wouldn't see with Capital Pride to create a massive, massive pride around the city. It's gonna be super gay. I ain't gonna lie to y'all. <laughs> it's, it's gonna be real gay. And you can keep the pride vibes going all year long. All of our stories are up on the NBC Washington app. You can watch them on Roku, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire TV. We couldn't possibly have a pride special without remembering someone in our NBC4 family. Our champion, friend, and fiercest ally, Wendy Rieger, passed away far too young this year from cancer. The Capital Pride Alliance remembered Wendy with the President's Award, honoring her for her decades of undying service and love for the LGBTQ community. We all wear a pop of red in her honor today. And she's remembered for her work for years to come. LGBTQ community, which uh, is, have we had fun or what? <laughs> is that they have been the best dates of my life? Oh. Have been at uh, this at Smile, the Gay Men's Chorus, and uh, all the different organizations that they have invited me to and made me feel like a member of their family, which is which is just wonderful. It seems so right to wrap up our first Pride special with something Rieger loved. Young people singing about their futures. We say goodbye and happy Pride with a TV premiere from the Gen Out Youth Chorus singing their original song, Write My Own Story, composed by Jim Papoulis. Thanks for watching and happy Pride.